Um, well, thank you, Moises. That was extremely interesting, and I'm sure all of us were sitting here trying to think of examples, counterexamples, questions why, etc. And so we do have some time. Uh, Moises has graciously agreed to answer some questions. Please raise your hand if you'd like me to call on you, and um, please tell Moises who you are. Who would like to begin? Somebody would like to begin? You. Peter. Uh, hi, Moises. Uh, hey. Thank you very much for a very provocative presentation. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I have to say who I am. Peter Kingstone, um, uh, King's College London. Um, I, I do want to ask you, you say that it's counter, counterintuitive and against the narrative, and um, I, I'd like to know how do, you, how, do you, how do you reconcile what you're saying with <coughs> the American perspective, at least, where the, the one percenters have been concentrating income since the late 1970s, have been mobilizing since the late 1970s, and so even if electoral politics looks more competitive and uh, presidents look more stymied, the same people have been, well, bought Congress in you know, the early 1980s and haven't relinquished it. So for example, uh, we still don't have any meaningful financial regulation in this country protecting consumers against those one percenters who've managed to accumulate so much income over the past 40 years. Thank you. Yeah, and, and thank you, Peter. That's a great question. And, uh, the, and I, I have the exact theme in the book. How can I deal with a world in which the one percenter, the one percent accumulates uh, so much wealth? And th there, is, there are good answers to that. Uh, the first is that Essentially, this is a story about income inequality and uh, becoming more acute, in income deep, deepening in income inequality and wealth inequality. And um, what you will, well, there is no doubt that the, the in income inequalities have become more acute. The notion that they are the same people is wrong, is statistically wrong. There is churn at the top. The one percent, there is churn. In the Forbes 400 list the, 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 of, of the billionaires in the world, in this year's article that starts, you know, Forbes says, and here we, have, we present you the 400 wealthiest people in the world. And the article starts, if there is one word to describe our list this year, it's churn, in which as many people have fallen out of the list of the wealthiest, uh, as many people have come. And, um, and there are some studies about what has happened to the wealth. The wealth of the richest people in the, in the, um, in the crisis uh, dropped 37%. The wealth of uh, the middle class and the lower income dropped 11%. Now, if you are living day to day and you are making a very, very hard, difficult life, reaching at the end of the month, if you have an 11% drop, that's a catastrophe. You, it's essentially catastrophic. If you have a billion dollars and you lose $370 million, well, you know, it's going to a couple of days of being grumpy. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it's not that, that problem. But, but, but there's more than that. And, and so also if, and then your point, your good point about uh, the financial sector. After the crisis, there are about five or six financial groups that came on top. JP Morgan and Barclays and uh, um, Goldman Sachs, uh, and six. They concentrated uh, a huge amount of financial assets and they were the masters of the universe. And of course, they have very powerful lobbies. Lobbies that uh, stifle any attempt at reform, as you said, any financial regulation, consumer protection, uh, and all that. Except that look at what happened to them. One of them, uh, you know, one of the top banks that came uh, out very well after the, the, the crisis is Barclays. Barclays was the one that bought Lehman Brothers. All of the, they, you know, they left all the bad things and just got the, 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 the very good assets that uh, remained of, of Lehman Brothers. And the person that engineered that was the master of the financial universe, the, the CEO of Barclays, Bob Diamond, who's now fired. Uh, look at uh, Jamie Diamond, who, of course, was a very strong and very vocal opponent of any regulation. He is on the record several times saying, leave us alone. No one of these idiots that is trying to regulate us can understand better than we do our business. 
and we have people that make a million dollars a year or millions of dollars a year that are doing this, and we are capable of self-regulation. And he was the point person in the media and in Congress in trying to, 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 to defend this thing until, oops, you know, there was an accident at J.P. Morgan in which, you know, they discovered that under his nose there was a billion losses. No, not a billion, two. No, no, not two, five. Every, every week the number uh, of this uh, organization that we were told uh, had very capable individuals uh, in, 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 in charge of uh, uh, controlling uh, was imploding. And just two weeks ago, they, they, we saw in Congress a parade of, of these individuals being grilled. Now, is this just kabuki and theater and nothing will happen and they will find a way of diluting the thing? Perhaps. But uh, Jamie Dimon today is not Jamie Dimon two years ago. Bob Dimon today is not Bob Dimon who went out of, and, and Goldman Sachs, if you talk to them, they will explain to you how there are a hundred things that were, they, were, they took for granted in the past that they could do without asking and that they would just wield their power without uh, having to justify or ask anything that they now cannot do. I am not worried about them. Uh, and I think, still think that uh, the financialization of the American economy is a big problem. Uh, but uh, I do believe that uh, the, the trends that I describe also apply to them. Let me, let me ask you, uh, in terms of your analysis, what would you think is the future of something like these um, regional or sub-regional groups such as the European Union or even countries? I mean, and if you think countries will fragment, do the bigger countries tend to fragment first, you think, or more? Or is it the little ones that fragment more? That, I think, is a crucial question for the 21st century because underlying that question is what is the optimal size of a nation? So uh, is the optimal size uh, the one that you get after integrating and having these groups and the European Union having some sort of pooled sovereignty, sovereignty and, and trying to, to work together? Or uh, you are better off if you are Catalonia? Uh, or the Basque Country, or the Northern Italy, or the Wallonia in, in Belgium, you know, trying to uh, uh, get independence. And the answer, the very difficult answer, is that the optimal country size is small for politics and large for economics. And that tension creates a lot of problems. So the, uh, an, op an optimal country is one that is small enough that allow, to allow some good governance and governing. If you, are, you, know, if you have 10 time zones and uh, uh, billions of people, and it's very hard to manage. So from a political perspective, size, large size, is not, as ver no, it's not very good. But from an economic perspective, of course, size gives you the scale that you need uh, to compete internationally. And that speaks to the groups that you, you mentioned. Thank you. Over here. Uh, yeah, keep, keep your hand up so that the mic can come, please. Wait, who, and who are you? Yes, Waldo Lopez from Hero oh, Packer. Um, you can I, also say that you're a YESA graduate. I, yes, I come from the same alma mater, the YESA. Now, my, my question is, what, what are the implications for all this discussion, which is, which are the skills that people, companies, and universities should be looking for uh, to develop, because the skill probably would be a set of skills difference, transportable, and more looking for influencing. So how can we do that, and how can we allow people who have the same vote to the same power of communication to have the same information, education, such that that information is an educated information and not the, the dictatorship of the, of the majority, right? As, as the founding fathers always were afraid in the US. Right, it's, a, it's a great, another great question. So it's different, the answer is different if you're talking about countries or if you're talking about a political party inside a country or if you're talking about uh, a business or if you are a manager, if you are a manager for, let me deal with the manager, the, the, the managerial aspect, the, the business side of this. One of the very important things that we are discovering is, and one of the tensions that many companies are not managing well, 
is the tension between being as highly specialized and have the peripheral vision that allows you to look uh, at places that you don't normally look at for what, to see what threats and competitors are, are doing to you. By that I mean that in today's world there is hyper-competition in ways that we have not seen before and you all know the reasons. So in order to be a very good company and a very profitable company, you have to be obsessive about being extraordinarily good at what you're doing. To be obsessively good at what you're doing creates blind spots and makes you obsessively looking at exactly what you do. If you are UPS, you are going to be looking at everything you need to do, and if you're Hewlett Packard, you become whatever. And then something happens and you get a competitor out of places that you did not imagine. And so the, the, the need to retain peripheral vision at the same time that you are highly specialized is one of the challenges. Think about the competition that uh, the Washington Post or the New York Times had. Who would have said that something like Craigslist would destroy the business model of something like the New York Times or the Washington Post? There's a, another Kodak. Kodak, as you know, for many decades was, had almost a monopoly of everything photography. You know, the Kodak moment became part of, uh, of the lore. And uh, no one could compete. It was very hard to compete with Kodak. They were very, very good at what they do, were they're doing. And now they're bankrupt. They went out of business. They're trying to recover, but they went out of business. This was a company that dominated the sector for many, many decades. Meanwhile, more or less at the same time, there was an app called Instagram, which was three years old and had 13 employees and was sold for a billion dollars. Kodak would never imagine that their competitor would come out of some kids organizing and you know a startup and have an app that, that ran in, in a cell phone. So that is the peripheral vision, you know, the tension between that and the notion that your competitors are gonna come from places that you cannot even imagine, and if you are too too narrow focused, you can lose that. The second very important uh, lesson is um, Beware of titles, and, be, and beware of assuming that uh, titles uh, confer authority, and that, uh, that that's what you need. That in, this, in these days, uh, companies and organizations and human enterprises have different rules. And employees and clients and customers and suppliers and, uh, are, have different expectations. And, uh, and just the notion that this is done this way because I say so, that's a phrase that is losing uh, potency daily. Uh, size, the notion that you, the big size yields power is another, and I think Hewlett Packard is a very good example. Uh, uh, the notion that, it, that you need to be very large in order to be powerful. Well, we don't know that that's not the case anymore. Power is good, but power can, can, can also be, I'm sorry, size is good, but size can be lethal because it makes you unwieldy, slow, uh, and, uh, and, and, and rigid. And, and finally, um, vitocracies in business. Uh, beware of situations in business in which you have a lot of power centers capable of blocking everybody else. Companies where you have a board of directors or a st shareholder structure that is fragmented and divided where there is uh, tensions and lack of coherence between the shareholders, the board, and the top management, where you have labor unions, vendors, uh, distributors that are very, very powerful and capable of imposing their view. And so at the end, the company runs because you find a space that satisfies everyone. And the, the top managers spend their life navigating in, in ways that uh, to find that space that satisfies everyone. And that is the road to failure. That, you know, if you, see, you find yourself in a company like that, run for the door. Well, I, I wish we could go on forever, but we can't for a variety of reasons. But this gives you a glimpse of Moises and the way his mind works and how, how broad he is in terms of what he knows. And um, if any of you are interested, his book is outside. Um, it's, uh, what is it, number seven on 
which list was it? The in the bestseller. Bestseller list. So, uh, and I'm sure many of you have seen him on, on TV. I mentioned earlier, I've seen him a few times on Morning Joe. So it's, it's been a great honor and Thank a you, pleasure and a privilege to have you with us today. And wait, before, before you all leave, um, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, you've been a great audience. I want to thank all our speakers, uh, who were all excellent. I want to thank the staff of the center, particularly Susie Davis and Isabel, our teammate, and the rest. And I, I invite you now to think about coming to next year's ninth annual Latin America Conference. Thank you very much.